So good afternoon, everyone, and, and good morning to, to, our, to our speaker. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's a really a, a big pleasure to, to introduce this afternoon um, Kate uh, Head Marston, yeah? and she's joining us from Harvard uh, University. <clears throat> And uh, Kate uh, studied uh, mathematics and chemistry at undergraduate level at McGill uh, in, in Canada. And she's, uh, as I just learned, originally Canadian. <laughs> yeah? But then he did her PhD at University of Chicago in theoretical chemistry. And he's now uh, at Harvard, where she's work working on the modeling of quantum systems, uh, open quantum systems uh, using classical and quantum uh, resources. Yeah? And, um, um, I, I, I sort of met Kate <laughs> at the APS March meeting this year, yeah, uh, where she missed my talk <laughs> because, because the speaker after, before me was missing, so the time of my talk was put uh, forward by 12 minutes, and that was enough to, and, and after that we, 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 we met uh, via email, and, uh, and I thought the best uh, way uh, always to start um, uh, a scientific relationship is to invite someone to give a talk, yeah, because then you understand exactly what they're uh, what they're doing. So, Kate, we are really uh, glad that uh, that you accepted our invitation and that you did the big sacrifice of waking up at <laughs> probably at five o'clock in the morning today. Yeah, so thank you very much for uh, for your effort, and um, and we are really looking forward uh, to your talk. And uh, if you would like to start sharing uh, your screen now, you're you're, you're most than welcome. Yeah. And while sure. you do, I, I quickly remind the, 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 the participants to use the Q&A facility and um, to ask questions. And since we are not so many, maybe they can also raise their hand and we can give them the right to, uh, to speak. So, Kate, please, it is uh, your show and uh, you're welcome to, to start. Thank you very much. For sure. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me to come, come chat. I'm really excited to be here to talk about my work on open systems. Um, and so, my name is Kade Head Marston. It's a it's a hard one to pronounce, <laughs> and I'm going to be talking today about dilation based quantum algorithms for the time evolution of open quantum systems. And so this is research that I've been doing with Praneha Narang at Harvard University, and it's in collaboration with David Maziotti at the University of Chicago, and then Sabra Kais and Zishwan or Andrew Hu at Purdue University. And so with that, I'm just kind of going to get right into it. And so. This is a slide that I probably don't need for this crew, but just a basic introduction on open quantum systems. And these are basically quantum systems whose property and or dynamics are driven by their environments. And so here is a you know, diagram that you've probably seen a million times and we'll see another million times during this talk. But here I've got my quantum system and then I've got two arrows, one going from the system into the environment to represent loss of information or energy. And then I also have an arrow from the environment into the system to represent some sort of recovery of entanglement, of energy, whatever it might be. Um, so I am coming from a theoretical chemistry background. My PhD is in, in electronic structure and open quantum systems, but from a chemistry department. And so there's kind of motivation behind why I started to care about open quantum systems and why a chemist in general would care about open quantum systems. And that first example that I have is molecular energy transport in photosynthetic light harvesting. And so if you are looking at some sort of photosynthetic system, what you have is light will come in, it will create an excitation on a chromophore, and that excitation, usually in the form of an exciton, will get passed around between different chromophores and eventually get passed into a reaction center um, or a sink where it can be used for productive work by whatever organism is performing this photosynthesis. Um, this, in general, is a very, very complicated system in terms of you usually have these chromophores surrounded by you know, protein environments or you know, just large kind of biological structures. And so often it is easiest to treat these systems like an open quantum system and say, okay, these chromophores, we can treat them as two level systems that are either excited or not. Um, and that can be our system in our open quantum system. And then the protein environment can be our surroundings. And so what we can do is we can say, this is how the excitonic transfer is going to happen within the system due to the presence of the environment, either in terms of coupling, in terms of thermal relaxation, whatever it might be. A second example that is less chemical, but currently quite relevant um, is the dynamics of a qubit. And so we can think of qubits also as two level systems um, and their environment. So either the thermal fluctuations in the room or you know, surface spins on the surface of whatever they've been etched into um, will contribute to their dynamics. So either if for superconducting qubits, you can have decoherence due to the environment. Um, if you have photonic qubits, you can have just loss due to the environment. 
Um, and so if you want to model kind of the decoherence rates or the lossiness of a qubit, you could look at it through the lens of open quantum systems. A third example, and one that I think is, is really exciting and cool because it kind of combines different pieces of my background, um, is to look at the relaxation and decoherence in molecular qubit candidates. And so these are um, often kind of larger molecular complexes that have a transition metal or an anthonide center, so this green atom right here, um, and then larger ligands stuck onto this center. And those ligands and metal center are chosen in such a way that we're trying to isolate um, a single spin on the center atom. And a lot of this work is being driven by experimentalists. Um, the picture that I have up here is from a paper from Dana Friedman's group, who I believe is just starting at MIT right now, coming from Northwestern. Um, and she has done tremendous work in this field in terms of experimentally designing and testing these qubit candidates. The really cool thing here is um, what's gonna determine their candidacy, at least from a theory perspective, um, and also experimental, but from my perspective, theory and modeling, um, is the de decoherence time of that central spin, that isolated spin that we're trying to look at. Um, and so prolonging that decoherence rate or the coherence rate is going to be incredibly important for actually potentially using these and implementing quantum gates on them and potentially using them in a hardware platform somewhere down the line. And so modeling the electronic structure of this molecule potentially in an active space as your system and then the environment as you know either the ligands, the surrounding qubits, thermal fluctuations, whatever it might be, um, could give us good estimates on T1 and T2 times. And this is kind of an area where open quantum systems I think could offer a really um, interesting perspective and help guide the experimentalists in this area. And so with that, the focus of my current research um, is on can we use quantum devices or quantum computers to consider the dynamics of open quantum systems? And so if I had a closed quantum system, this would be a very, or a fairly straightforward question, nothing is ever incredibly straightforward. Um, but basically what I have here is if I were to isolate my system, so I thicken the walls to my system and my environment, it's no longer interacting. I can model this with the Louisville equation. So on the bottom right there, I have the derivative of the density matrix in terms of time. And it's equal to minus I times the commutator of the system Hamiltonian and the system density matrix. That's HD minus DH. Um, I'm in atomic units here, so my H bar is equal to one. In this case, my uh, time evolution is unitary. So it's, I mean, pretty easy to map over into a quantum computation framework where I have access to unitary gates. However, the second that I open my system to the environment, the second that I have this kind of two-way exchange of information or even a one-way exchange of information or energy from the system to the environment, um, I lose that unitary evolution. I'm officially looking at non-unitary evolution, which presents more of a challenge. And so in the simplest case down here, I have the Lindblad equation. Um, right now I've, I've absorbed that gamma decay rate into my C matrices. So these C matrices are my Lindbladians. And then my summation is over different Lindbladian channels. So different channels of environmental interaction. Um, you could think of them as being you know, a couple channels for having some damping, some decoherence, some dephasing, kind of whatever it might be. This can be you know, whatever number you need to model your system accurately. And then the squiggly brackets here, those are my anti-commutator. So that's C dagger C D plus D C dagger C. And so the challenge here is, a, is this non-unitary evolution. The second that I have even one of these Lindbladian terms, I've lost this kind of nice closed system unitary evolution and I need to use kind of um, some a little tricks to get, to get around that. And so what I'm really asking here is can I use a quantum device to model this non-unitary evolution? And so the quantum device side of this, what I'm asking is can I use these quantum circuits and these computational routines which consist of coherent or unitary operations on these qubits? So these are gates and measurements. Um, I have a little schematic right here, just, just as a kind of brief intro to what these computational routines are. So the horizontal lines are um, my qubits. So I've got qubit zero and then qubit one. This is just looking at a two qubit schematic. Um, and then I have a classical bit at the bottom there for readouts. That is so I can get the data you know, off that quantum computer and onto a computer where I can work it up, make figures and, and do all that. Um, U1 through U4 are unitary gates. Um, you can think of them, I think of them as unitary matrices. So UI times UI dagger is equal to the identity matrix. Um, you can use one or two qubit gates like U3 right here. There are also three qubit gates that we generally try to avoid because they're even more noisy. Um, and then the measurements, which are right here. So measurement is to get that data onto our classical device. And now the challenge here is mapping this non-unitary evolution into this unitary framework. So again, if I had a closed system, it would map kind of very elegantly into this framework because I could take my, my closed evolution that is a unitary matrix and you know break it down into a series of unitary gates. 
However, in this non-unitary form, it is much harder kind of to make that mapping and we have to use a couple tricks to get that done. Before I get into my work, I just wanna kind of acknowledge the fact that I'm currently in a group of, of people that have done a lot of really, really amazing work in this field and a lot of, um, a lot of you know work that is that is definitely worth worth mentioning and, and worth building on and, and you know continuing to to read and follow and so here's just a list of a lot of papers from from this group as well as some work from IBM as well as some work from um, collaborators at Purdue so the original work right here by uh, Andrew and and Sabre and so the, all of kind of what I've been doing is is trying to contribute at least a little piece to all of the the bulk of this work that's already been going on that has been so good and so for our contribution. Um, our method of solution to this kind of mapping of this non-unitary evolution into a unitary framework, we're using dilation methods. And so basically what we are doing is we're taking that kind of small system that we have and we are dilating it, increasing its space just a little bit, hopefully, hopefully the minimal amount possible, um, and then evolving that dilated system in a unitary fashion um, or as a closed system. And so this kind of schematic here is just you know expanding upon that original image saying, here's our system, now we've got a little bit bigger of a system. We've gone to a larger Hilbert space, and we're going to now evolve that in a closed form. And so basically, for our algorithm, if we want to actually put this on quantum devices, we need to actually do this classical preparation step first. And so often, we could actually just start straight with the operator sum form. But quite frequently, the Lindblad equation is kind of more physically motivated or more intuitive in terms of what those operators are to represent physical processes. So let's just say we're gonna start from the Lindblad equation. We then wanna convert it into the operator sum form. And so that is represented right here. So now instead of um, these C matrices, I'm using these M matrices, these M sub I, these are Krauss operators. Um, and so the summation now, in this case, I've put it as having just one additional Krauss operator, but you could actually have more additional Krauss operators for normalization. Um, the interesting thing with Krauss operators for us in this context is that they are contraction mappings. So the summation over the norm, so M I M I dagger um, of all those M I's is going to be less than or equal to one. And because that is true, um, we are capable of dilating. So because they normally contract the space, we can map them into a larger space um, in a kind of fairly elegant way. And so that's the next step here is we need to dilate this unitary. So each one of these Krauss operators we're going to dilate them into this bigger space. We're also going to dilate our density matrix. And from there, um, we can kind of go into our algorithm. But first, a little bit more detail on that dilation. And so early work on these kind of dilation methods focused on the Stein spring dilation theorem, which works actually quite well, but it's a little bit expensive. And so the dilation theorem that I have been working with is something that um, was originally kind of brought up by, by Andrew Hu and uh, Sabre Thais at Purdue. And so they use something called the SC Nage one dilation theorem. I might be pronouncing that poorly. And if so, I'm very sorry, and someone can correct me. Um, but this is what it looks like. And so the unitary dilated matrix is constructed from these Krauss operators. So the diagonal elements, this is the Krauss operator. This is the you know minus adjoint of that Krauss operator. And then the off diagonal elements are the defect operator of the Krauss operator. So the identity matrix minus MI, MI dagger, or the inverse for the other diagonal element. And so in the simplest case, you would think of Krauss operator, this Krauss operator being a two by two matrix. So the unitary operator is gonna be a four by four matrix. So I am doubling my space, um, but I'm doubling it in such a way that I now have a unitary evolution. And so that is over here that what I just talked about is this kind of right-hand side, I believe, of the, of the algorithms. This is the classical preparation. So I go from Lindblad equation to operator sum to the dilated unitary. Then what I have is a bunch of you know, dilated unitary matrices. And so I can compile my circuits, which consists of breaking that unitary down into a series of one and two cubic gates. Um, from there, I can run these circuits. So put them on a quantum device, put them on a simulator, kind of wherever I wanna run them. And then I can measure them. Um, and when I measure them, I'm either you know, finished and I, I have my final time of evolution. I have the dynamics that I want, I'm good to go. Um, if I'm not, then I need to update my time, recompile my circuits, rerun my circuits, remeasure them around and around um, until I've reached the final time of evolution that I'm interested in. Um, and so just to kind of break this down a little bit more explicitly, we're going to look at an example of a two-level system in an amplitude damping channel, and this is at zero temperature. Um, and so basically our operator sum form, in this case, we only have two Krauss operators. So we have one that essentially is responsible for transitioning the population from one state to the other. 
Um, and then we have another that is responsible for the normalization. And so this is kind of the starting point for us. We then are going to dilate. So our dilation itself of the Krauss operators I already talked about, and this is, you know, this matrix right here. So this MI and the MI dagger on the diagonal and then the off diagonal defect. We also need to dilate the density matrix. And so the way that we do that is we decompose the density matrix into a linear combination of basis vectors. If you want to, you can put them in, into, if the, you can put them into the state of uh, eigenvectors. You can also kind of choose any basis vectors that do sum to be your density matrix. Um, for a two by two, we are, this matrix right here, this UI is going to be a four by four matrix. Um, and we're gonna have a decomposition of this density matrix into two different basis vectors. And so from there, we have this new form. So instead of having the operator sum, or yeah, the operator sum form, sorry, we're gonna go into this unitary evolution form, which here's a density matrix. And now we're summing over, you know, all of our dilated unitaries, which in this case is just two, one for each Krauss map that we had. Um, and then we're gonna have the summation also over each of those uh, basis vectors that we originally looked at. And so this summation actually ends up being four terms. So I have the U0, uh, phi one, U0, or sorry, U0, phi zero, U0, phi one, U1, phi zero, and U1, phi one. And so I've gone from a summation that sums over two terms for the Krauss form to one that sums over four terms um, for this unitary evolution form, but this is an implementable um, evolution now. I can actually put this onto a quantum device. And so taking each of those terms, I can break them down into circuit decompositions. And so the state preparation here I've highlighted in yellow. Um, this is based on the states that I chose to decompose my density matrix into. So one of them is the excited state. It's a zero one vector and one is a one one vector, obviously normalized with one over square root two. Um, and so phi one, or sorry, phi zero is represented by this X gate. So you can see that is the first kind of operation that needs to happen both in this term right here, as well as this term right here. Um, and then phi one is represented by the Hadamard gate. And so that is, is right here and right here. The remainder of both of these circuits represents the gate decomposition of those unitary operators. So you can see that the top two other than that X and H look exactly the same. Um, that is because they are both the gate decomposition of that U zero dilated unitary that represents that, U, that M zero Krauss operator. Um, same thing with the U1. So you can see in this in this sequence right here, as well as this sequence right here, those are exactly the same sequence. It's because they both represent that U1 dilated unitary. Um, and then just kind of a bit of a breakdown of these gates in case in case you're unfamiliar or tend to forget, as I often do. Um, the H is a Hadamard operator. Um, Z is a is a Z gate. Um, X is an X gate. And then the two qubit gates. These are C naught gates. So these CNOT gates are the source of the majority of our noise. If you're gonna put this on a device, that is usually what is kind of gonna, gonna give you some trouble and give you kind of too much noise to be able to actually see your data. Um, and then these UTs are the, it's technically the U3 matrix or operator using IBM's Qiskit device. However, they are, um, in our case, we actually have two of the parameters. There's three arguments that go into a U3 rotation gate and two of our parameters are zero. So we're actually just looking at essentially what is a, a RY gate or a Y rotation gate. So that's what these are. This one, you're giving it the time and this one, you're giving it negative time. Um, and then these little symbols at the end here, those are my measurements. That is me taking my data off of my um, quantum computer and, and putting it on my classical device to work up and, and, and go from there. And so with that, we can actually look at this two level system in an amplitude dynamic channel, again, at zero temperature. And so this is the classical solution to Lindblad equation. So this is just, you know, run on my laptop, nothing special, nothing quantum computing about it, just, just the Lindblad equation. And I'm looking at, you know, an excited state decay from, from 0.75 and the ground state is gaining that population starting at 0.25. We then use kind of that unitary evolution and that circuit breakdown that I just talked about. And we put it on IBM CASM simulator. And so these are the results from, from that simulation. So the, they're diamonds and they agree really, really well with the exact solution. Um, I should note here that I'm not using a noise model in the CASM simulator. So this is just kind of with the inherent noise that exists um, in the CASM simulator, which I think is around 10 to the minus three. It is, it's fairly negligible. So it, it should agree quite well. Um, and it's using 10 or 10, yeah, 10, 24 shots. So two to the 10, I believe, is the number of shots, the number of um, executions that are done to obtain this data for each data point, which is the default setting for Qiskit's devices or for IBM's devices. 
Um, we then go and we look at results from IBM's London device. And so this was data that I took last year, um, last summer, I believe, and IBM's London device is no longer um, around. So it has been depreciated um, because IBM is, is continuously making kind of new devices that are that are always newer and better. And so some of the older ones, I think kind of get put to rest after a while. So I can no longer verify this data on this device, but I've run this on other devices as well. And it, it looks the same. Um, and so again, we're looking at this time evolution with the population and the experimental results on this actual quantum hardware look really good. They agree quite well. There's a little bit of a bias in some areas, but it's arguably you are getting the dynamics that you that you were hoping to get and that you know you should get classically. Um, one thing to note here that is kind of exciting about this data is that there is no error mitigation. So I haven't used any correction. This is just, I've, I've run these circuits and I have taken the data onto a classical device and shown them to you. I haven't done any post-processing, um, which to me is a very promising sign for these methods in terms of being able to actually look at interesting systems on quantum devices, because at least the, the simplest system is, is, doesn't require error correction, which is, um, kind of an exciting thing in this field because often often devices are too noisy to get interesting and, and relevant and accurate data out. Um, and so just a brief note on scaling here, the scaling of the gate depth is based on the number of non-zero elements in the dilated unitaries. And so the total cost of this evolution is around n to the five, um, where n is the size of the system. The added benefit here is that we can parallelize it. And so that those circuits that I showed you, those the result of each circuit does not depend on the other circuits. Um, and so we can really run those four circuits in parallel, which means we're not really adding circuit depth. We kind of split that cost into four parallel processes. And so with that, I kind of have a, a rolling conclusion slide that I'll bring up at the end of kind of every little chunk of this talk. But this one right now is just through these dilation methods, we can consider the time evolution of quantum systems, at least in a simple case in the Markovian regime. Um, and for a small system, but it's it's showing a lot of promise. And so from there, I'm gonna back up a little bit. Um, and I know originally I'm talking about these relation methods, but I'm, I'm just gonna kind of give some background information of, of how I got to the current algorithm that we're looking at for, for more broader class of dynamics. Um, and so my introduction to quantum systems and to open quantum systems was at the beginning of my PhD. And I was looking towards using the Lindblad equation applied to um, molecular relaxation using the one electron reduced density matrix. So the one RDM, I have it right here, um, but it's essentially you're taking your wave function, um, you're taking the, the full density matrix, which is the product of your two n body wave functions, and then you're integrating out n minus one degrees of freedom. So you're looking at essentially the probability of what you know one electron is doing in the field of n minus one electrons. And so what I wanted to do was take something like Lindblad's equation, use this variable of interest and see with those two, can we look at something like the relaxation of BH2? So that's beryllium in the center, a hydrogen on each side. And so basically what I was getting and what was people were getting in the field at the time was data that looks like this. And so I'm looking at the occupation number of molecular orbitals on the y-axis here, and then time um, on the x-axis. And we're seeing this evolution of the occupation of those molecular orbitals. Now, if you are uh, familiar with electrons, this, this image should make you quite uncomfortable. And that is because it is an extreme violation of fermionic statistics. So I am looking at um, electrons in essentially spin orbitals. So what I'm seeing is the second that I use this Lindblad equation to evolve um, my density matrix in time, I am getting an, a violation of fermionic statistics. So I'm having electrons that are bosonizing. And this is not a really kind of fun new physical phenomena that we've discovered. It is just kind of an error in our modeling technique. And so there's something that we were doing with Lindblad's equation and we were not the only people doing this, but something that we were doing with this that um, just wasn't, wasn't working. Something was unphysical about, about these results. And this was the first project that I took on in my, in my PhD is how can I fix this issue for Lindblad's equation with the one electron reduced density matrix to be able to apply this me method to look at molecular relaxation and, and molecular processes where I mostly care about electrons and fermionic statistics. And so what we did is we derived constraints based on NRF stability conditions. And so NRF stability conditions, I forgot to put a slide on these, but they're essentially um, the conditions that you must apply to a reduced density matrix such that it always maps back to a physical n body wave function. Through the equation that I showed on the earlier page of how you get a one RDM, you can always go in that direction, but NRF stability gives you kind of that that going backwards towards, um, you have a, you've propagated your reduced density matrix, you always wanna make sure that when you propagate it, 
you're not going into some sort of unphysical space. And so the constraints that we ended up finding um, were presented right here. So this is this kind of just for a single and body trajectory and um, essentially these matrices need to be normal. That is uh, what this constraint comes down to. And so if we apply that constraint into the same simulation of that BEH2, um, we get well-behaved occupation numbers. We no longer have this violation of fermionic statistics. Um, everything is kind of decaying as it should and, and reaching some ground state that is um, consistent with fermionic statistics. And so this was the first kind of summer or semester of grad school for me. And this is what I started and, and was working on and was excited about because from here, what you could do in terms of chemistry is you could look at absorption spectra or kind of really, really any dynamical process. Um, and then I had to go to my candidacy and figure out kind of what was I going to do for the rest of my PhD. And the first question that I was thinking about was, could we preserve Fermi statistics in a more general dynamical case? So right now I've been using the Lindblad equation and we had derived these constraints, it worked well. But what if I had a strong coupling, a system that was strongly coupled to the environment, or if I had memory effects, if I had something else going on? And so this is, you know, straight out of, out of the Brewer and Patricion textbook. Um, but the equation that we first looked at was a very simplified version of the Nakajima's Wanzig equation. And so this is the generalized master equation in kind of a very trimmed down and, and, and cute form. But we're looking at a density matrix derivative on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, we have an integral over um, kind of system history with the memory kernel. So this kappa right here, um, and then times the density matrix. So if that kappa is the, the delta function times the Lindblodian, then I recover my Lindblad equation and I'm back where I am. Um, but this, in general, this equation represents a much broader class of dynamics than just Lindblad's equation. So I was kind of um, new in grad school and, and gung-ho about this. So what I wanted to do was just take this equation, you know, plug in and representability constraints and have my constraints pop out and then I can model, you know, anything fermionic with this master equation. The problem here is that usually this has to be treated perturbatively. And when you perturbatively expand and then you truncate, you're risking positivity. Um, and positivity is kind of the lower bound of your fermionic statistics. So for the Lindblad's equation, what I was trying to impose was an upper bound. Lindblad equation guarantees positive semi-definite character. So I already had that zero restriction. What I all I had to do was say, okay, we need to, you know, preserve it so that we don't go above one. Here, this was gonna be a lot more complicated, right? Because I don't have that lower bound and that creating that lower bound, creating a method that is positive semi-definite or guarantees positive semi-definite character um, is very much a non-trivial task. And so I, I think I presented this uh, weekly at my candidacy exam and, and didn't get any questions on it, but it then kind of led into um, a lot more work during my PhD than I thought it was going to be. And so what we did is we started kind of to build our own method. So I didn't want to use the Nakajima Zwanzig because that was just getting kind of too complicated. I didn't want to use a perturbation theory. I wanted something that was going to be um, positive semi-definite on paper. And so at the time, what, what I knew really well and what I was working with is the Lindblad equation. And so here it is again up there. Um, to solve this, I need some initial condition. So you choose, you know, some initial density matrix. You, you know, use that for initial condition in your ordinary differential equation and you will get some propagated in time density matrix out, this detailed right here. So this is great. It maintains the positive semi-definite character because it's just a Lindblad equation. Um, it also can preserve from statistics if I apply those constraints that I had derived earlier. Um, it's only Markovian though. It's only, it's still derived in the born Markov approximation. It's still a Lindblad equation. So this doesn't give me any new information. This is just kind of what I was already working with. So what if I do it again? What if I take a different starting point and I propagate that in time to where I am now and I get an dense matrix. This one again still has all of those, the good things of positive semi-definite character for my statistics, um, but again, for Markov approximation. So if I do that again and again and again, um, and then I take a, a statistical weighting of these auxiliary or D tilled or these gray density matrices, I obtain a new density matrix at this time um, that will hopefully have more information packed into it. So as long as my statistical weights here are positive, then this density matrix at the time, the current time will also be positive semi-definite. So I'm taking essentially a positive average of positive values. Um, but the hope, and on paper, at least this is true, that this should incorporate more information. So I should be, because I'm having all these different initial conditions, I should be capturing more memory effects of the bath and therefore a much broader array of dynamics than Lindblad's equation alone. Um, and so on paper, this, this works out quite well. And this is kind of what this ends up mathematically looking like. So that diagram, if I you know do that in the discrete form and then take a limit into the continuous space, 
I get something that looks a lot like this. Um, this is formally easier to solve than the Nakajima's Wanzig equation because it is a simplified type two Volterra equation, which those words are kind of just jargon, but basically it means if you open numerical recipes in C, there is um, an algorithm which will solve this for you. And it preserves the positivity of the density matrix provided your weights are positive, but the challenge here lies in determining those statistical weights. So just like there is you know, conservation of energy, there's a little bit of conservation of difficulty in these problems. So I've you know, made it easier to actually solve this equation, but I've just pushed the difficulty kind of into a black box of these statistical weights right here. But this is the method that I'm gonna be working with at this point. Um, and so basically we wanted to verify this during my PhD. When we first came up with it on paper, it looked good on paper and it looked like it was gonna be functional and, and a little bit like the Krauss operator formalism. Hypothetically, it could capture all dynamics, but we wanna make sure it actually does what we want it to do. Um, and so here is a little bit more data that is, you know, directly taken from this textbook. Um, and so this is the Jaynes Cummings model, um, which is a two level system in an optical cavity. And we're looking at the strong coupling regime on resonance. And so this is essentially um, a very good example or a very good benchmark for methods that are kind of going beyond Lindblad's equation or beyond the Markovian regime. Um, since as you turn up the coupling between the system and the environment, you get an increase in um, signatures of non-Markovianity, usually I think independent of what non-Markovian measure you are using. So this is the exact solution. This is analytically solvable. It's, it's some combination of hyperbolic sine functions and cosine functions. Also, you know, in that, in that non-Markovian chapter of the open quantum systems textbook. Um, here's the Markovian solution. So a single embodying trajectory, I just get straight to K. Nothing exciting, kind of exactly what you would expect. Um, here's the generalized master equation to second order. And so this is an exact kind of example of of why this wasn't the equation that I started with is because at 10 units of time, I'm getting an almost negative 40% chance of population. Um, and so that is, you know, violating the positivity and therefore that lower bound of my statistics. Um, and here's our method with our ensemble of Lindblad trajectories with statistical weights. And so this agrees perfectly with the exact solution. And so at least for kind of the simplest case of, of more general dynamics, we can in fact capture you know, a more, a more involved set of dynamics. So we can enca and capture this resurrection or this recurrence of population that is visible in the strong coupling regime of the James Cummings model. Okay, so with that, um, that kind of whole background tangent was basically to set us up for the a recent paper we have in, in physical review research right now that is um, talking about using this ensemble of Lindblad trajectories method on a quantum computer to essentially look at kind of that same data at this point, just as a benchmark, but look at that James Cummings model um, using quantum hardware. And so this was the schematic that I always use for this for this method because it's kind of the easiest pictorial representation. Um, but we're looking, you know, at this this ensemble average of different trajectories. And so what I had shown earlier in this talk is how I could do an algorithm, how how we could perform an algorithm to look at one single trajectory. And so what we want to generalize now is because this is just a statistical weighting of different trajectories, can we use that same framework? Um, and that same kind of dilation-based approach to look at, you know, non-Markovian dynamics on a quantum device. And so this was our algorithm flowchart we had before for just a single trajectory. So we have Lindblad's equation to operator sum to dilated. We compile our circuits, we run our circuits, we measure them around and around we go, and then we're finished. In this case, um, we can actually do almost exactly the same thing. So we still start with the same Lindblad's equation or operator sum if we're lucky and we know our Krauss operators. Um, we can then dilate everything. We'll then go and we'll compile our circuits, we'll run our circuits, we'll measure our circuits. Now, in this case, instead of um, kind of being done with that time point, we have to repeat that compile, run, measure cycle um, every kind of trajectory. So in that simplified diagram that I showed that just had you know, three trajectories, I would need to do this cycle three times to get that one density matrix that I was showing at the bottom of the slide. Um, and then I can take that off the quantum computer, I'll take my ensemble average, and then I'm finished. The very nice thing about this is that I am adding complexity. I'm do, having to do this compile, run, measure cycle several times. Um, however, I'm not actually adding any qubits and I'm not adding any circuit depth. And so in terms of, of uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum devices, this is kind of the best case scenario is that I can still use those simplified circuits, those, those fairly short circuits um, that I only need for one Lindbladian, but I can just run them multiple times, which is essentially a linear scaling and complexity increase, which to obtain kind of a much broader class of dynamics, I think is, is best case scenario for right now, at least. And so here again are these circuits. So we use these circuits again for the James Cummings model for each trajectory. And then we use statistical weights to kind of average these trajectories 
or take an ensemble average these tra trajectories in such a way that we could uh, look at the James Cummings model. And so here is, is our benchmarking data for, for this kind of slightly more generalized algorithm for, for more general dynamics. And so I'm now looking at the James Cummings model in the strong coupling and detuned regime, um, just for, for variety in the dynamics that I'm going to show you. Um, and so we are looking again at the population of both the ground and excited state. So ground states and gray excited state is in teal, and we are looking at the time evolution. And so this is the exact or the classical solution. So it's the exact solution again, uh, done on my laptop, just, just nothing special, nothing quantum about it. Um, here are results from IBM CASM simulators. They again agree very, very well with the exact solution. Um, again, I am I'm not using a noise model. So these are um, kind of using almost a perfect simulator with a little bit of noise, but essentially negligible. So we're, we're lucky that it does agree well, but it's also it should not be as surprising as, as the actual device. Um, and again, with 10, 24 shots, so two to the 10 uh, shots for each data point. And then let's see if we can, there we go. Um, this is our results with IBM's London device. And so these X's there are from, from the device itself, again, that we used last summer that has been depreciated, um, but they also agree very, very well with the exact solution. Um, and again, we are not using any error mitigation strategies or any kind of noise reduction strategies. So there's no post-processing where you're just taking the data right off the computer, taking that ensemble average, and then putting it in the plot. So it's it's a pretty good start, I think, for, for these types of methods. Um, and so from there, I can kind of add another thing to my conclusion slide and saying we can treat Markovian or non-Markovian dynamics at least in kind of our toy model. So at least in, in, in small systems. And so then the question always comes up when you're using quantum computers is can we find or utilize a quantum advantage? So for physics and chemistry being mapped into quantum hardware, one of the main goals is finding a physical system where there is a concrete advantage of using a quantum computer over a classical computer. These methods, um, so far we've only tested them on you know, two level systems on quantum computers, which means these are analytically solvable systems and we're not gonna find an advantage. Um, and I am not coming from a quantum information background. So I think I could you know, theoretically look at this for my lifetime and I would never find kind of an improvement. But what we can do is we can scale up to bigger systems and see how do these methods scale? Where might we find an advantage for different methods? Is it, you know, is it based on the methods? Is it based on the system? Just kind of explore the, the breadth of these methods. And so the first system that we are trying to explore is the Fenham Matthews Olsen's complex. And so this is a photosynthetic light harvesting center that is found in green sulfur bacteria. Um, here is a large image of it. Um, and so what I showed on my second slide of, of kind of motivating why I care about open quantum systems, it was actually kind of taken from this complex. So inside here, you can see there are these, um, there's black ball and stick structures. And so those are the chromophore centers that I talked about before. So basically an excitation will be created on these chromophore centers. It will get passed around. Um, and then these ribbons are this protein environment that will kind of jostle it and you know either help or hinder its transport. Um, the cool thing about this complex and about a lot of natural occurring photosynthetic complexes is that excitonic transfer occurs with nearly 100% efficiency. Um, the real reason though that we really like this complex is that it is very, very well studied and there's a lot of experimental and theoretical data available. So we'd only use kind of these two level exactly solvable systems and we wanna branch out, but we don't wanna immediately jump into the unknown. We're still kind of benchmarking our algorithms and, and figuring out how we can apply them to real systems. So we wanna stay in the realm of, of well-studied systems where we can compare our data. Um, just, just a comment here. There has been a ton of work on this complex that I, I that I don't want to neglect, and so um, Blankenship. I mean, there's textbooks that he's written about that. Um, Aspera Guzik, Engel, Fleming, Kais, Maziotti, Scholes, Hamshepper, Brudvig, Batista. The list goes on and on and on. Um, both experimentally and theoretically, there is a ton of work that is very, very um, excellent work done on this complex to study the dynamics, the transfer, the structure, um, the functionality, everything else. Um, and so, with that, I want to simplify this a little bit. So that image on kind of the last slide there makes um, someone who, who was kind of brought up academically in, in, in electronic structure uh, very uncomfortable because that was a massive, massive structure. Um, and so here what I'm looking at is a very simplified version. So this is a uh, one trimer of that SMO complex. So that giant kind of mess of ribbons and chromophores has three of this image. Um, and then in each one of those trimers, you have either seven or eight chromophores. Um, but there were there was a paper in um, 2011 by Nolan Scotchpole and David Maziotti that showed that there's a lot of quantum redundancy in this process. So basically what you have is energy comes in through the chlorosome antenna 
it gets passed to the chromophores and then it gets passed around the chromophores until it ends up in the reaction center. And so what Nolan and David showed was that um, this part of kind of the efficiency in terms of modeling is because there is so much of this redundancy. And so you can actually look at a chromophore subsystem and obtain accurate dynamics from just that subsystem. And so the subsystem that we are looking at is this chromophore one, two, and three, um, as well as the reaction center. And so instead of having to look at you know, three trimers of seven or eight chromophores, we can only look at three chromophores and still predict uh, dynamics that will agree with experiment and with theory. Um, and so we end up modeling this with a five site system. So one site is chromophore one, one is chromophore two, one is chromophore three, one's the reaction center or the sink where we want the energy to go, and one is for dissipation or the ground state. So if we lose that excitation, if that exciton, you know, tries to get transported and gets kind of dissipated into kind of the protein environment, then that's where we're going to catch it just so we can keep our accounting uh, going well. And so this is a classical simulation of this process. So this is using Lindblad's equation with, you know, optimized parameters for the system. Um, and what we are seeing is the excitation starts at chromophore one and it is beating back and forth. So this is an exciton population on the y-axis and then time on the x-axis. And we are looking at it beating between sites one and two. So it's kind of bouncing back and forth and it's slowly decaying into the sink, which is this navy blue line right here. The ground state is not picking up any population, which is what you would expect if you're going to have roughly 100% efficiency, you should not be losing that exciton. Um, and site three doesn't really participate. So chromophore three is not really involved in this process. So again, this is our classical simulation. This is using Lindblad's equation. Um, and here's our quantum simulation. So this is using IBM CASM simulator, again, with no noise. So kind of the, the minimal noise model that's already built in. Um, and these results agree fairly well, almost precisely until the end a little bit with the exact solution, um, which is again, you know, a fantastic example of, of this algorithm doing quite well on a more complicated system. So you can see kind of the, the dots are, are right on the line for all sites and this ground and the sink. And so one thing to note with this is that the, if you are kind of are familiar with this literature and familiar with the Fenn and Mathis Elsons complex, um, the full dynamics that is presented usually looks something like this. And so that big red line that I have there is the length of our simulation, but ideally we would want to look at about a thousand femtoseconds. And that does not negate the work that we've done because I think it is, it's a really awesome step towards looking at real physical systems. And you do get a, a pretty good picture of, of what's happening at um, within 300 femtoseconds, but extending that into a longer uh, range would be kind of nice for generalizability, for being able to look at maybe a bigger complex or um, a complex that has longer coherence times. And so the kind of the work on this needs to be through this classical transition. So the Lindbladian matrices for the FMO complex or the Fenn and Matthews Olsen's complex, uh, we know those from previous studies. However, we have to map those into the Krauss operator formulation, which, which we did, but we did it in kind of an incremental time step method, um, which is a little bit challenging in terms of, um, of, of how to actually make those accurate. And so the, there's a lot of extra cost that we kind of built in with this transition. Um, the other thing here is that we need to implement error mitigation. So now we are you know, looking at a five site model, which requires more qubits and the gate depth is, is pretty wild. Um, so we don't actually have computer data, some hardware data, real kind of, we don't, I don't have London device on data on this one. Um, and so these are kind of the two things that, that we need to kind of work on going forward, um, but that those should not kind of negate the fact that this is one of the very first kind of real physical models that a quantum algorithm has been able to capture the dynamics. Uh, and so with that, I can kind of add that point to my, my rolling conclusions list. And that is we can treat real physical models. We've, we've used kind of a benchmark system, but it is a real photosynthetic model that is found in green sulfur bacteria. And it is kind of the actual exotonic dynamics that do occur in that complex. Um, and so one other work that is, that is not for me, but I, I wanna bring up is there's a paper out of IBM on archive right now that actually uses the thermal relaxation of the qubits as a resource for open quantum systems. So they do simulation of diradical pairs um, in molecular complexes, and they use a Krauss operator formulation, but then they also use the thermal relaxation kind of as a resource, which is a very, I think, cool thing to look at in terms of that to me could be one of the benefits of using quantum hardware for open quantum systems is that your quantum hardware itself is an open system in a sense. And so if you can really exploit that, that, that is kind of 
a way that you could maybe make your simulations a lot more simple on a quantum device eventually um, than on classical hardware. So that's an archive link that is that is right here. Um, it's I think it's led by Brian Roast, I believe is the, is the first author, and then Barbara Jones. Um, and then with that kind of the conclusion of all of this work for me right now is is that open system dynamics offer a very unique and exciting direction to harness the power of quantum computation. Um, and with that, I want to thank my uh, postdoc advisor, Pranaya Narang. So this is where I've been doing all this algorithm work. Um, my PhD advisor, David Mazziotti, who has been collaborating with us since then, but that was the ensemble of Lumbaud's trajectories method that was all done under his supervision. Um, Sabre Kais and Zeshwan or Andrew Hu, they were the ones who originally put together that uh, the use of the se Nage dilation theorem. Um, and we've continued to collaborate with them. That FMO work is, a lot of that is, is the brilliance of Andrew. Um, and then Stefan Krasnov, another postdoc at Harvard University, who has kind of helped me get into quantum information and get into quantum computing, then funding from NSF, DOE, and the Harvard Quantum Initiative, and IBM for resources. I also have the papers that I talked about um, are all kind of linked right here, as well as my email in case you have questions or comments and don't have time to ask them during. And then thank all of you for, for coming and for listening to me chat for the past 45 minutes. Yeah, Kate, thank you very much for a really nice. excellent, uh, excellent talk. It was really uh, outstanding. Thank you very much. Um, let me ask now uh, Ilya, Graham, and Camille if they have uh, questions, and um, and I encourage the, the, the participants to to ask questions as well, either through the Q and A or by raising their hand. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, uh, yeah, maybe I, I can start. Uh, yeah, I have maybe. One general question, maybe to start mm -hmm. with. Um, just let, so, yeah, you by the end of your talk, you you show this like generalization, uh, so to modelize this uh, this complex uh, involving in the photosynthesis, and uh, so yeah, my my question that was that. Uh, so in the beginning of the talk, you you focused on on a two level system. Into in order to modelize the, uh, or to reproduce the, the open uh, uh, dynamic, you use so another an extra uh, two-level system. But now, so for for that uh, for that uh, so later simulation, uh, so it's not anymore two-level system. I, I I would say you need at least uh, four or five levels. So how can you? How did you did you yeah? How did you implement that? Uh, on 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 the quantum computer because I guess you yeah. need much more qubit now. Precisely, and that's also why we don't have experimental data on that because it's it's bigger. So it's a five site model that we use. Um, when you dilate, you then end up with a you know, a ten by ten matrix because um, you're doubling you're yes. doubling your your matrix space, um, and then from there to map it into a qubit platform, it needs to be you know two to the something. So I think it ends up being a 16 by 16, which is two to the four, I believe. So we, you needed at least four qubits for those simulations. I think we used um, potentially a six, a 16 qubit device as in simulation. Um, but yeah, so it, it is, it's the same construct as the two levels. It's just um, a much larger system. So yeah, it was multiple qubits, which is also why I'm not showing circuit diagrams stuff for that, because the circuits are, are very, very deep. So they're they're not nearly as kind of cute and compact as the ones that I showed before. Okay, thank you. But um, yeah, so so, but I mean, it's it's a usual issue. But yeah, so if you now want to increase even more the size of your of your of your system, yeah, you will quickly be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, the, the the nice thing with the dilation method is that in terms of qubits, you only actually are adding a single qubit for at least for the one dilation, because you are doubling the space of your matrix, but yeah, that means not, that you only need the single qubit, right? Yeah, it's, but it's yeah, you're not right. too it bad actually, But right now with the, the hardware that we have access to, you're, you're absolutely right that you quickly hit kind of a cap on what you could put on an actual device. Um, yeah, but it's, it's always the same issue anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, but I have, I mean, I have other questions, but maybe one more before Graham or Ilya asks the question. You, you mentioned also that in, in that same simulation that you you would like to, so you are able to, to simulate only up to a given time. I don't remember exactly which time in that. Yeah. 
and and you 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 wish you 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 be able to to simulate to longer time so what's the what's the issue uh, with longer time why can't you simulate to longer time um, it's, so it's an issue that we're having with mapping the uh, Lindblodian operators to Krauss operators. So the way that we're doing it is in, I don't want to say differential form because it's not quite accurate, but there's a kind of a square root of a time step between the two. And it means that our time step itself is limited. And then the noisiness of the device as we kind of get, get further along tends to build on itself. And so it, it means that we lose accuracy even on a simulator. Um, and so a lot of that is just due to our, our classical inability to, to really, I don't want to call it an inability because we are mapping them, but the inefficiency of the mapping that we have between Lindblad and Krauss operators, because these are um, essentially numerically optimized optim or numerically optimized parameters for this complex in the Lindblad form. Um, and so it's, the, it's that mapping into the, into the Krauss form that is giving us a, a bit of a hard time. <laughs> okay. Okay, I see. I'm also happy to give more detail on that afterwards if, if you're interested. So I don't, I don't have the, the slides on me right now that show the math of that, but I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, I don't know if uh, Graham or Ilya or anybody else in the, uh, has, has some question. Um, yeah, I had a few questions. Um, yeah, okay. but, like, thanks for the talk. I thought it was really interesting. Um, this might have been covered a bit by what Camille asked, but just to kind of clarify my own understanding, like with the the unitary, the dilate, the one dilation that you talked about at the beginning, which the method is based on. Um, so in principle, this like one dilation, um, it's you, you use it to dilate the the the. So you have like a reduced dynamics of like a two double system, and you use and you use that dilation formalism to represent this in like a as a, like a unitary evolution of a of a four by four system. So that'd be a two qubit system. So how do you deal with like, if you have like a D dimensional system, um, do you just like repeat this dilation like like many times? Maybe that's what, I guess that's maybe what yeah. you're talking with Camille so about. Um, there are higher order dilations, but you, you, that you don't need them for um, larger systems. So you'd, you could still use the one dilation for a, a D level system. That would be totally okay. It would just, you know, be bigger so you're gonna you're the one dilation will always double the size there are higher order dilations that you will need say i had multiplied kind of multiple cross operators together then i would need a higher order dilation and, and that would scale differently and off the top of my head i don't i don't remember right now what that scaling is and i haven't used those yet um but no you wouldn't it, it would just double the size of your your d it would double your yeah the size d of your system to do the one dilation if that answers that. Okay. Yeah. No, I think that. Um, yeah. So my my second question was more related to the um, like the Limbladian the ensemble Limbladian trajectory equation that you mm -hmm. had. So I wasn't exactly sure like what the relationship between the param because in that equation you have like a delay time mm -hmm. um, and you have additional kind of like statistical weights. So when yeah, you yeah. want to simulate that, like what's the relationship between like how do you kind of maybe choose is the wrong word, but how do you kind of like fix these things? Like, are they just done like in a variational way or? Yes, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's a really, that's a good, really question. good question. <laughs> and that is what we always get for that method. Um, and so that is that is the hardest thing with that method is how do you how do you choose the statistical weights based on time lag? And so we've been um, lucky in terms of so far, we've only really benchmarked it. And so we've used numerical optimization towards an exact solution because we know the exact solution in things like the James Cummings model. Um, going forward, if you wanted to look at um, kind of like unknown systems that you don't have that kind of control, then you, yeah, variational minimization you could do. You could do um, like a very short-term evolution and extract those parameters to longer term. You could do kind of, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of different things you could try depending on the system that you had. But the data that I've showed today, all of that has been numerically optimized towards an exact solution because I'm looking at an exactly solvable model. And so basically our goal was to just kind of benchmark, make sure that if we had all the information we needed, it does in fact work. Um, but you're you're absolutely that's hitting the nail right on the head in terms of what the the challenges of that method are, and in terms of um, if we want to branch out, if I want to look at a system that I know nothing about, then I do need to do some kind of massaging and figuring out what parameters are going to be optimal for that system. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, this is just more like additional comment. Like I, mm -hmm. this is kind of slightly speculation on my part, but like the equation, like this ensemble equation that you had, mm -hmm. to me kind of looks somewhat similar. There are like other like methods in open quantum systems theory that are based on like constructing like a completely positive dynamics by yeah using the ensemble average of like many like trajectories i guess i like off the top of my head i think there's things like they, they refer to like semi markov processes yeah 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 like, there's a lot of yeah yeah you're absolutely right any, yeah sorry i didn't know if there was any relationship between like you know like your approach with these like other like ensemble approaches yeah, I do believe they are related. We we have not done like the mathematical comparison between that method and anything other than the generalized master equation, but that would be um, an, an interesting thing to look at. And that's kind of one of those things that I'm I'm trying to focus my postdoc on on quantum computing. And as soon as I'm done with my postdoc, I'll be back into that method development and seeing how it ties into different um, methods a little bit better, and also how to generalize it, which is is the weight selection that you that you brought up earlier. But yeah, that's a, that's a very a very good comment. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I think there is a question by Anikan. Anikan, please, you have the rights to, to speak. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thanks a lot to the presenter for the uh, rather, uh, should I say, uh, illuminating talk. And uh, to that extent, I want to draw the presenter's attention to the comment she made earlier on when she showed uh, a ligand that uh, had mm -hmm. a transition metal complex and said uh, the idea was to isolate the spin on that and then use that as a physical framework to develop this qubit. So my question is, how do you do that? And then as a follow on to that, I'd like to draw your attention to the plot you showed on page 49, uh, where you showed on the y axis the population as a function of uh, time. Mm -hmm. uh, there were two curves there, and uh, around 20 picoseconds, I saw that the ground state and the excited state kind of uh, matched. So, my question is what is the physical consequence on, on your physical system? What, what does that coincidence point mean, and how? Uh, how do you disentangle the, the qubits into, let's say, the zero and the one state when you are representing it with just one spin? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, of course. So the first question, sorry, I'm just going to back up. The first question was about the transitional complex, right? Um, right. How they isolate the spin, I am not sure. This is the brilliance of the experimentalists and, and, and kind of what they're doing with this work. And so the, the molecular design is not an area that I am um, an expert in. What, what would be interesting to me is being able to calculate the electronic structure of that based on kind of the geometry and using one of, of many electronic structure methods and then seeing how that evolves in time in an open system model. But the actual kind of isolation of that spin and the design and the optimization of these um, molecular complexes is, is the brilliance of the people that work uh, in this field. And if you're interested, there's a lot of literature. Um, the stuff that I'm most familiar with is out of Dana Friedman's group um, at Northwestern and now MIT. Um, but I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm qualified to, to speak on how one designs those. Um, in terms of the second question about the, the crossing point, is this the plot that you were speaking of? Yes. Okay. And so the, the question is, is the meaning of the intersection? So, so let me, let me clarify the context. Let's say sure. this is presenting a physical system uh, at yeah. ground state, at excited state. You would imagine then that there will be uh, a spin configuration that you are representing with say some mathematical function. My question is at some point between zero and uh, 10 picosecond, uh, the, the populations match. So how do you, what does that mean from the point of view of the physics of your system? I'm not sure. It, I might be misunderstanding, but I'm not sure it has a deeper meaning other than um, there. There is just a point that they um, are equivalent. I mean, you're you're looking at one decay and it's decaying and giving its population to the other one or giving its energy to the other one. So, I think that's just the point that they they are equal. And then you know the the ground state is lower energy, so it's going to keep decaying and keep acquiring population while the population is coming out of the excited state. 
I'm not, I, I might, I might just be, be ignorant here, but I think that that's, I'm not sure there's a deeper physical meaning other than an exchange of information between, or of energy between these two states. Um, and there is a point that, you know, they're equal before they continue on their, their way to, to equilibrium, essentially. All right. Thanks a lot for that. Um, but Chair, with your permission only, I'd like to do a follow on to the first point that I made based on the response I get on this page. And, and that will be- Just ask. Yeah. Thank you. And that will be then that uh, if the physical system is in only one state that has just one spin, then mm -hmm. how do we toggle the qubit into an on and off state at ground state? I, I don't, I'm not sure I've, I've understood the physics there. Do you have only one spin, you'll still have multiple states, right? Because if you have one spin, spin your, your you know, spin up versus spin down will be a different state. So you can still have it like a two, a two state system or a multiple state system with only one spin. Um, does that answer that question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, are there further questions? <clears throat> okay, it, it, it doesn't seem that there are any further uh, urgent uh, questions. Then um, it is my, my pleasant duty to, to, to thank you very much for your really nice, uh, nice talk. And, uh, you know, yeah. usually if uh, in the pre-COVID times, if we had speakers, we, we used to invite them for dinner <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Today, we will probably have to skip it. And, uh, <laughs> but I hope that maybe in a post-COVID area, we will be able to, to invite you to Durban and, um, and then we will owe you, we will pay you <laughs> that we owe you. Yeah, so that will be, uh, but in any case, it will be very nice to, to, to stay in touch. And uh, I'm sure that we can maybe pick up on some of the questions that were asked and see if we can uh, come up with, uh, with some joint activity of, of, of common interest. That would be really very nice. Yeah. That would be lovely. <laughs> yeah, then uh, thank you very much, Kate. And uh, you're probably going for breakfast now. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> About okay. that, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, very much again for, for the effort of waking up so early to, to be with us this afternoon. Yeah? For sure, and, thank you. Uh, we will send you later uh, the, the the link to your to YouTube so that you're welcome to share it with your with your networks. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Have a good rest of the day, and thank you to you everyone too. for being with us today. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.